So I'm going to talk about syncope and mainly the kinds of things that are red flags that you would want to worry about in your practice and patients you might see on a day-to-day -day basis, kind of trying to uncover those patients that are really at risk for sudden death, since we all see lots of patients that get a little dizzy um, or even pass out for very reasonable reasons, okay? I kind of think of this as a multi-specialty um, endeavor. People can come in through all kinds of portals. Um, I think the most likely place would be to come to your office for primary care, maybe the school health office. Um, but a lot of mental health patients are also in this category. They're either on medications that put them at some risk or people are worried about that. Uh, and so I see a lot of patients um, uh, referred that way too, certainly from the emergency department, from emergency services, and then the things that um, can help you out once you get to the hospital. Okay. So I kind of want to talk about the overview a little bit. We'll talk about the scope of the problem, meaning sudden death, um, what kind of risk assessment uh, we want to do, um, work up for the symptomatic patients, and then um, thinking about athletes, because that's on everybody's mind. Uh, that's a huge amount of the kids I see are, you know, athletes that need to get cleared. Talk a little bit about the inheritable causes for sudden cardiac death. and. Um, I'm not really going to focus a lot on congenital heart disease because that's kind of another um, topic. Okay, so the estimates for sudden cardiac death are kind of all over the place. Nobody's really sure what that denominator and numerator are. It's probably somewhere around 500 cases a year in um, young athletes, which are defined as um, 15 to 40. I used to think that was too old, but now I think that's really quite young. Uh, up to 50% of them may have had symptoms, but a lot of them won't, or they won't have admitted it. And I find particularly the boys do not want to go and admit to anybody that they felt woozy or dizzy or anything because they want to push themselves. But a lot of the, the girl athletes are just as driven. Um, but 80% of them, if we um, get a chance to do that, we can figure out underlying cardiac cause. So just a couple of studies to give you a little bit of the scope of the problem. Uh, this is from Australia. This was 427 children who died suddenly between the ages of 5 and 35. And that was over a 10-year period. And about 50% were cardiac. So that's about what most studies will show you. And pretty much in the U.S., if you think about, if you take sudden cardiac death in athletes, it kind of breaks down like this. About half of them will be hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And there's, you know, symptoms and things that we ask about to try and uncover those patients. Then another 25% chunk are going to be coronary anomalies. And so there's some historical things that we can do to ask about and things like that. And the other 25% are what I spend a lot of time on are the inheritable arrhythmias and what we call channelopathies, kind of funny currents and things like that that cause things like long QT syndrome. Um, so... Those are the kids that may present with symptoms, and obviously a horrible symptom of either near arrest or an arrest. But then we worry about how we're going to uncover these patients that are asymptomatic, and what does that all mean? And really, it all gets down to what we do as good pediatricians. It's all in the history, a little bit in the physical, and here and there, rarely an EKG is of great help. Okay? And family history is huge, and that's what we're good at doing. Inheritable causes, um, of sudden death, frequently you pick up a child who's had some sort of symptom and then you start to get the family tree and sometimes it takes a really long time to get that. Um, I ask, I don't just say, is there any history of sudden death in the family? People a lot of times will say no to that. So of course, you know, I need to explain, teach my fellows that you have to ask a lot of um, CSI type questions is what I kind of feel like. So I'm asking, you know, did anybody ever ride their motorcycle um, off a cliff? Not exactly, but you know, un unwitnessed, unexplained single car accidents. Drowning is a huge one, and now we're coming into summer, so there are um, lots of swimming pools um, out there that are open. Drowning, near drowning. Um, uh, you want to ask about uh, hearing loss in uh, other family members that goes along with long QT syndrome. And I'll get to those details in a little bit. Um, syncope with exercise is a huge one. Obviously, those kids get referred very often, certainly if there's uh, other sudden cardiac deaths in the family. So first off, I think you kind of need a template in your mind for screening. So this is one of my favorite ones. It's from Contemporary Peds a few years ago. And the actual data of it doesn't matter too much, but just sort of that concept that, you know, you kind of always ask all those same questions. Um, not everybody has a practice where people could fill out a form like that and give you that kind of information, but all the data on here, and I think you got the slide presentation, um, I put it on there so you'd have a, uh, a good screening tool that I, I think gets at a lot of those questions. But you'll see it's 
Has, have you ever passed out during exercise, fainted with exercise, um, fatigue with exercise? A lot of exercise type questions and then those family history questions that I talked about already. Um, so there's kind of three main ways that kids come in symptomatic. One is syncope and sort of what goes along with that, near syncope, dizziness, that sort of category. Then there's chest pain and lots of kids have chest pain and most of it's not cardiac. Um, in children and so we're trying to tease out which is which so that we don't do huge workups on everybody and then the palpitations rapid heart rate so I'm an electrophysiologist so I see lots of kids who've had palpitations and rapid heart rate and even those aren't always um, anything that's going to cause sudden death but they may be causing symptoms so let's talk about syncope first by itself um, when is that dangerous lots of kids pass out I, ha I saw a child the other day who had passed out sort of typically on the risers, in a school performance, um, heavy robes on. Um, I was seeing that child, but when I listened to more um, details about the event, three other kids had passed out and sort of fallen off the riser that day because it was boiling hot. You know, so there's probably a very reasonable reason for why that a child passed out, so um, that was kind of an easy one. Um, and you're always trying to figure out in your mind whether or not it fits with a vasovagal mechanism or dehydration, or obviously if they're ill for some other reason, or is there something lurking there below the surface? And that's, I think, kind of the question we want to think about. So to me, like I said, those three main categories, if you have syncope and chest pain and palpitations or something like that, one of those isn't so bad, but if you start adding them together, then I worry. So if it was palpitations and you passed out, I'm going to worry more. If it was chest pain and you passed out, I start to worry that there's something more dangerous at work. So that's sort of those three main um, uh, categories. Obviously, if they've had cardiac surgery, um, that puts you into a whole other risk category. And if you passed out and you have a scar on your chest, then somebody needs to make sure that you didn't have a bad heart rhythm uh, or an obstruction or something like that. If you got injured when you passed out, meaning that you didn't guard at all, it was so unexpected that you fell down and broke your nose or something, that's more worrisome. But even in those patients, um, before I became a cardiologist, I was an emergency physician. So I used to see patients on the other side of, um, of the tracks, I guess. And, you know, there may be even a reasonable explanation for that, that they tripped or they fell or, you know, that sort of gets to that CSI piece. And then, again, in the family history with each one of those kind of symptomatic patients, I ask all the things that could masquerade as something else that was really an arrhythmia type of thing. Seizures are also another one that um, can sometimes be what happens when you pass out if you have like convulsive syncope. So what are the potentially fatal causes that we uh, worry about when we see somebody who's had garden variety syncope and we're trying not to make a huge deal out of it? So what are we worried about? The hereditary, uh, we call them channelopathies, are one big category. And these are where your potassium or sodium currents, for the most part, are either too much or too little, and your heart is not repolarizing normally. And so one of those categories stretches out your QT. So we actually have a marker on your EKG that something funky is going on way down at the cellular level. Um, there's a little sister uh, component. Uh, syndrome called Brugada that I'll just show you the EKG on in case you've heard of it, but um, we're seeing more of that. And we can actually test for a lot of these genetically now. So we're now going to be faced with patients who are the asymptomatic sibling with positive genetics, and that's another whole category. WPW is one of those things that can cause sudden death. It's easy to see on an EKG. You would hate to miss it, which is why I always counsel um, uh, people who are being seen for syncope that you get at least one EKG. So if you go to the emergency department or you get seen somewhere for syncope, unless it's obvious that they were dehydrated or whatnot, I would get an EKG just to prove they don't have WPW so it's something ultimately fixable and can cause sudden death. It's a small risk, it's 0.1% per year, but still it, it's out there. Obviously congenital heart disease, um, hopefully you would know that about somebody, but if they're a new patient in the emergency department, you've never seen them, just have to make sure you look at the chest and make sure there's no scar. Cardiomyopathies, and there's a ton of those, but the most likely one to cause sudden death is hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. You know, your heart's so thick that the blood can't get out the LV outflow tract, probably causes um, uh, coronary poor perfusion to the muscle and then gives you an arrhythmia. Uh, we talked about coronary anomalies, and I'll show you a little picture in a second of that. Congenital heart block could cause sudden death, that would be pretty low down on my list, and then aortic stenosis, kind of one of those classic um, um, congenital heart diseases. 
So um, you can look at that picture, but the way I explain uh, vasodepressor syncope uh, to my patients is that um, they have nice, healthy, strong hearts that contract very well, and if they have a little bit decreased volume, so that when the ventricle contracts, it contracts a little stronger than it would normally if you were really well hydrated. And then there are C fibers in your muscle that go back up to your brain and sort of tell your brain you have hypertension. So your body makes a mistake, and that's sort of the first part of that loop. So it sets in motion all kinds of things that are not the least bit helpful. In other words, you start to pool in your legs, because well, I'm probably doing that now, um, pool in your legs because you vasodilate, and now you even have less um, vascular filling in your heart, and so you get into this vicious cycle of pretty soon you don't have enough perfusion to your head, and there's a mechanism for having that happen, which is to make you go down, and then you perfuse your head. And that's sort of the basic way that vasovagal syncope happens. And I explain that to my patients just like that, um, because I'm trying to put the big push on them to drink a lot of water, not just a little water. And, you know, it's, it's hard, um, and they're all adolescents, and so nobody wants to do anything that anybody told them to do, and, and they probably won't, but I give them the speech anyway. And salt just helps you hold on to fluid, obviously. Some patients, when they have, uh, get into the second limb, where they actually get a huge amount of catecholamine surge, and rarely, 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 like I would say probably once a year, um, I will treat a kid with a beta blocker, which sounds kind of counterintuitive when you're having low blood pressure and maybe low heart rate. Um, but those are kind of special cases. So really, if they stay extra hydrated, they can prevent that. Um, again, personal family history, and I, I know I'm sounding like a broken record already, but there's so much information in there that it's really key. Um, then obviously, physical exam uh, will be the other thing we do. And we're basically looking for signs of outflow tract obstruction, so systolic murmurs, mostly the left-sided uh, murmurs up into the neck. Um, you know, cyanosis or clubbing would be obvious to anybody. Um, if you had a gigantic PMI that you're worried about, cardiomegaly, that would be obvious to you. And really weird pulses would be obvious to everybody. And then EKG, which, you know, I sort of make my living at, so uh, we'll talk to, about that in a second. When you have two together, like I said before, if you have chest pain and palpitations, then I start to worry that you had such a fast heart rate that you didn't have very good filling, so you didn't have very good coronary filling, so you maybe actually were getting chest pain because you were having a little bit of distress and ischemia. So that can happen if you sit at a heart rate of 260 or something like that for half an hour. Um, and again, the same sort of functions that we're talking about. So special circumstances are sports and sudden death. We spend a lot of time worrying about that, of course, because we don't want to have a tragedy on our hands. But we also don't want to restrict kids from exercise. I mean, I'm the mother of an athletic kid, and I know that um, it keeps them out of all kinds of trouble. And, you know, so I work really hard not to restrict kids. Um, even if they have um, sort of borderline things, I try and let them exercise as much as possible. But it does put them at risk if they happen to be vulnerable. Um, so that's what we're doing is sort of day in day, even without thinking about it, we're, we're screening kids for whether or not they can play sports. Um, the data from uh, Barry Marin is sort of the guru of uh, sudden death with athletes in the U.S. Uh, and uh, it, the same data came out when he looked at sudden deaths over, um, I think it was quite a few years. Um, again, it was about half of it was hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Now that's in this country. It's very interesting. If you go to um, Italy, um, where all kids get EKGs at birth, and then all kids get EKGs when they're about 12 or 13, and they get a very modified little itty-bitty, like few steps. They walk up and down steps, and that's sort of an exercise test for them. And somehow, between the EKG and that, they screen out almost all the kids with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. On the other hand, uh, so their, their deaths from hypertrophic cardiomyopathy are like 2% instead of us, where it's about 50%. On the other hand, they restrict tons of kids. Uh, who are not allowed to exercise. So it probably wouldn't fit with um, sort of our culture and what's important to us. Um, basketball is, you know, on TV, the one that's the worst for sudden death, and it truly is. And I think it's because it's a combination of two things. You're very aerobic, but you're constantly cooling down. So the autonomics of it are like, if you wanted to stress someone to see if they could have an arrhythmia, basketball would be the perfect way to go because they're sprinting, you know? They sit down, they chill, they jump, and they just have to go for it. 
you know, and then they sit down again. And so it's kind of like the worst possible. Um, football's bad that way too. Also, they wear so much heavy gear that they're kind of loaded down um, while they're doing it. Um, and then the other sports kind of um, trail off a little bit. Uh, there are some discrepancies. Uh, one of the things we worry about is that um, a lot of African-American kids will have what looks like left ventricular hypertrophy on their EKG. On the other hand, a lot of um, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is in African-American kids, so we still have to screen for that. You can't just say, oh, it's a normal variant if you really see big voltages. That's kind of the teaching point there. And this is the um, um, Italian data. Um, in uh, Los Angeles, they tried to do a screening. Uh, they did about 1,300 kids to see whether or not doing echoes was a good way to screen, which obviously is really expensive and labor intensive. And after they looked at that many kids, they only picked out one child with something that was uh, risk for sudden death, and it was WPW. So I don't think anybody feels like that is a very cost-effective way to go about that. Depends um, what your symptoms are, obviously. So I want to talk a little bit about the inheritable forms of uh, these sort of channelopathy things that you may see on EKG, the reason why it's a good idea to do it. So this is a patient with long QT syndrome, and you don't need to measure it. You don't need to do anything fancy. You can tell just by looking at this EKG, at the QT, EKG that the QT is really long because, I guess I can use the mouse, um, because this is the beginning of the QRS, right, and your T wave goes all the way to here. If your QT is longer, greater than half of the R to R interval between the two QRSs, that's going to be a long QT. It's going to come out to about 500 when you correct it for your heart rate. So just eyeballing that, that's a long QT. Okay? Uh, and I want to just talk a little bit. There's 12 kinds of long QT now, and there's about a million genes for all of it, so it's impossible to keep track of all of that. But I want to give you three main types of long QT syndrome and the historical pieces that go along with it. So when you're asking those questions, that's what you're thinking about. So type 1 long QT is the most common one, and I call this the swimming pool people. And these are um, events that classically happen. They have a high heart rate running around the pool, you know, so your heart rate's up, you're kind of aerobic, and then you jump into the swimming pool, you get this huge vagal stimulus, creates a diving reflex, which lowers your heart rate but that's at a high catecholamine level and something just happened to lower your heart rate. And that combination of things makes you very vulnerable down at your muscle level for some ventricular mischief. And that's where you get into having ventricular tachycardia or that classic one we call torsades. But it's high heart rate running around in the hot sun jumping into a swimming pool. And you see how that um, T wave looks like a huge mountain? It's almost, we call it kind of Himalayan. It starts right away at the um, QRS and it kind of goes straight up and it's gigantic. That's sort of the classic EKG for type 1 long QT. Okay? Type 2, uh, and that's a potassium channel defect. Uh, type 2 is also a potassium channel defect. Uh, it uh, has a cute name uh, made up by a lab person somewhere. It's the HERG mutation, human ether agogo. I'm not sure exactly how they came up with that. I call these people the alarm clock people. Okay? These people are more sensitive to medications also, so a lot of patients on psychotropics, if they get brought out and have a huge long QT, are probably in that category if they really have long QT. These are the people that go to sleep, so they're at a low heart rate, okay? So type one was a high heart rate and you did something to lower your heart rate. These people go to sleep and they have a low heart rate and they have a big stimulus that happens to them, so they get a big adrenaline jolt at a low heart rate, okay? Um, and it's like an alarm clock. So their sleeping alarm clock goes off and it gives them um, a bad ventricular rhythm. I had a family uh, that I followed for, it took about a year. This is a good example of taking about a year to get the whole story. So it was a patient on psychiatric meds, had syncope, got admitted to the hospital because the QT was pretty long. People weren't sure, there might have been some family history, they were kind of worried. Um, took her off her medications, her QT normalized. But as the family history kind of dribbled in, this is what we have. This, is, this took me a year to get this. Also, kind of a family in crisis, so it took a little longer. So, great grandma was awakened in the earthquake in 190 whatever in San Francisco um, from her sleep, had a seizure, and died. The grandmother was awakened by a telephone call from her daughter, who was in the military in England, um, and her daughter heard her pick up the phone. 
all of a sudden gurgle, fall to the floor. Um, she didn't die, um, but she had this event because of being awakened in the night. The mom had had a similar event when one of her kids woke her a baby crying in the night um, and had a seizure and was unresponsive for a minute or two. Never got seen by any doctor for that. Um, she eventually divorced the guy who didn't take her to the doctor, but that's another story. <laughs> and then the girl is here sitting in my office. And um, so we did genetic testing on her, and she had type long QT2. And so did um, her brother. And um, you know, other family members started coming out of the woodwork all with that. But that was amazing to me that the earthquake piece was what really amazed me. But it all fits with sort of the alarm clock people, OK? Um, it's pretty hard to live without ever being awakened at night by something, <laughs> right? Like that isn't really going to you know, be a comfortable, you know, and I, I realize that there's no house officer that has that because that would be impossible. <laughs> so, you know, if you figure out that somebody has that, you have to protect them with a defibrillator because there's just no way to protect them with meds or anything, okay? And then type 3 is a, another animal. That's a sodium channel defect. So for those, um, you'll see, and I forgot to mention, the type 2 has this horrible, really hard, these are the ones people fax to me because it's really hard to measure those QTs because the T waves are flat, they have like a little notchy thing in them, you can't tell what's the T wave, the P wave, and all that, so that's those guys, those are the alarm clock guys. Then the sodium channel people, um, uh, they just die in their sleep. You don't have to wake them up, they just go to sleep and they die in their sleep. So obviously you can't protect them very well without um, some sort of device. However, those were the ones that were the probands that we knew about, and that genetic testing is very early uh, in its uh, sophistication. And I think we're going to find out that there are a lot of people who have this mutation who aren't at high risk, and that is really under development. So if this is the future of pediatrics, I would say that the future of a lot of this is we're going to figure out what you do with people that have positive genetic tests who don't have symptoms. Because we don't want to put defibrillators in everybody. We don't want to make everybody into an invalid, you know? And so that's really, I think, a huge piece of what, what we're working on now. But those, that EKG classically will have a very flat um, ST segment and then a T wave way out over here, and sometimes the next P wave's even before that. So it's a little hard to sometimes figure out what the QT is on those patients. Okay, so family history for that, which we were already good at asking, but just so we remember what, you know, you ask about exercise, um, high catecholamine states, whether things have happened in that, that's more the type 1. Um, sudden loud noises, um, again, that tends to be type 2. But I, none of this is written in stone, and any of this could happen to the other form, so I'm not saying that if I saw that I'd say, oh, that's it, you don't have um, type 1. And again, family history, yeah, ask about anything that sounds like somebody passing out um, because they're not perfusing their brain. So seizures are another thing I ask about. Okay, so this is that like yucky rhythm that we hope we don't see. Um, but this, just so you have a, if you haven't looked at this for a while, this is what torsades looks like. So this is the rhythm that we don't want to see. But this is what happens to the person when they jump in the swimming pool, or this is what happens when they get the alarm clock waking them up in the middle of the night. But you don't always die with this amazingly. People come out of it by themselves. So syncope is still a possibility as a symptom. So it's not like everybody presents with sudden cardiac death. Um, this is the little sister that I was talking about, which is called Brugada, and I'm only just going to show you one thing on the EKG. This is rare, but you might read about it, and it's the same mutation as type 3 long QT syndrome. One of them causes too much sodium current, one of them causes too little. And it has a very classic EKG, which looks like a right bundle branch with ST segment elevation. It looks like you're having an anterior MI, but it's only in V1, 2, and 3. So that's sort of the definition. And I wouldn't expect people to, I mean, peop, other cardiologists send me EKGs to ask my opinion about this, but I just wanted you to have heard of it. Um, but if you look here, you see how wide and weird that QRS is. So that's not that normal little skinny RSR prime that you see on lots of EKGs in normal kids. This is really abnormal looking. You'd look at that, you'd know something was wrong. Okay, even if the Brigada name didn't come to your mind, you'd know there was something wrong. 
Okay, just to talk a little bit about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and what you would see on the EKG for that type of patient. So here you have somebody who passed out with exercise. And you hear a little bit of an outflow tract murmur, so you're worried that maybe there's uh, hypertrophy. And you happen to see an electrocardiogram, and what you'll see sort of typically is you'll see some evidence of strain in the left ventricle. Now normally, kids will have, uh, very often they'll have inverted, I just want you to look just at the T waves from V1 through 6. In V1, you can have an upright T wave or you can have an inverted T wave really through adolescence. But once it turns upright, it should stay that way, all the way across your precordium. So once it's upright, wherever that happened, if it flips down again, oh, sorry, um, out here in the lateral precordium, that's not normal. Okay, if it's inverted all the way across and finally turns up by V6, that's okay too. But you don't want it to be normal looking and then flip down. Then I worry that you have hypertrophy. That's like the little pearl for that, plus huge voltages. And what you'd be uh, suspicious of is that you had a big thick heart, like here, or a big thick heart. This is a little cross section on echo of a really gigantic septum compared to a nice little skinny one. Um, one other uh, type of cardiomyopathy that we worry about in terms of the sudden death piece is this other thing called arrhythmogenic right ventricular dysplasia. So, of course, we can't say that, so we say ARVD. How these patients often present is they have a bunch of PVCs that look weird or maybe some ventricular tachycardia, and we will sometimes do MRIs to make sure there isn't fatty replacement of normal muscle. Let's skip that. Uh, so if you looked at this, uh, so this is a patient I saw about eight years ago who came in for conjunctivitis. It was that kind of clinic day, you know. Um, and uh, actually there were two kids that day, so I don't know what was going on in New York that day. But, um, so, and, and, but he's talking to me, he's totally fine. But that looks pretty creepy, doesn't it? This is to contrast with something obviously that will look normal but will be creepy. Um, so this is ventricular tachycardia, but he's talking to me, he's stable. I mean, I gave him some medication and we dealt with it, but he's asymptomatic. Um, I just wanna, in the last few minutes, talk a little bit about um, what I kinda call like sharks hiding underneath the EKG. So um, this patient was at school and she was sitting in her math class and she fell out of her chair. And of course, I didn't get all this story until later because that's how things go, you know. She fell out of her chair. The school nurse was right next door, ran in, and started doing CPR on her. They brought the AED. By the time they put the AED on her, it said no shockable rhythm, so they didn't. So we don't really have an EKG from when she was getting her CPR. She gets brought to the hospital and gets admitted. But the story got a little diluted by the time she got to the hospital and it became syncope and the whole CPR thing had been sort of pushed under the rug as if she probably didn't really need it and I'm not really sure and you know sometimes that'll happen like oh they overreacted and things like that. So the nurses told me that in the unit it seemed like she when she'd get out of bed she'd have um, by Gemini, she was having lots of PVC. So I said, well, let me do her stress test then rather than torture my partners. I'll just go and see what happens. So that's what she did after only a couple of minutes of exercise. Um, so that's horrible, scary, yucky. Um, but so what it really was is she really did get CPR. And she heard as she woke up, she heard the nurse saying, um, well, she had no pulse. And she could tell people that, so then people didn't really believe that she'd been asleep. But you can imagine how that would go, how many times you'd have to tell the next person in the room, well, she had no pulse, and I did CPR. And then somebody else would come in, and she said, well, she had no pulse, and I did CPR. And this was a hospice nurse who had pronounced people who, I, I called her myself as soon as I saw that, and I said, so tell me the story again. And she said, I really, you know, I'm a cardiac nurse, and I'm a hospice nurse. And I said, so you can tell if there's a pulse, obviously. And she, there wasn't. And, um, that was what she did. And th she's talking to me the whole time. So you realize that when she passed out, it obviously was a lot worse. So I think I need to stop, right? Y yeah. <laughs> One minute. <laughs> so what she had is a rare but bad thing um, called um, catecholamine, polyventricular, polymorphic ventricular tachycardia. But what it comes down to is she has abnormal cells in her right ventricle. And that's what we do the uh, uh, MRI sometimes to look for fatty uh, um, uh, infiltration there. 
and it's all catecholamine related. So you can put them on a lot of beta blockers, but she's at such risk, obviously, having had CPR that she'd need to get protected too. So um, one more, I can't resist. Um, so this is a 10-year-old um, a, uh, a who comes into the emergency department um, not feeling great. Um, playing soccer, had a fast heart rate. It's really fast. It's SVT. And I just wanted to make the point that we kind of use these phrases kind of interchangeably, but you can't tell when they're in SVT if it's WPW or not. And then he got some adenosine, and we could see that he had nice, fat, chunky delta waves all over the place, so we knew he had WPW.